Hi everyone, thank you so much for waiting. Uh, apologies for uh, the slight uh, technical difficulties here. Um, but uh, again, everyone welcome. Uh, this is Patricia I'm from International Hospital Federation. Uh, I hope you're all safe and in good health and uh, thank you so much for joining us today. Um, so managing this complex and rapidly evolving COVID-19 has been extremely challenging for hospitals and health systems around the world. Um, we at the IHF are hosting this webinar and live Q&A series to share experiences, good practices, lessons learned from our members, partners, and other organizations. Uh, just a few reminders before we begin. All attendees will be on mute throughout the webinar. If you have any questions, you can type them by clicking the Q&A button. We'll try our best to go through all the questions later. Uh, the recording of this webinar will be available on the IHF website after a few days and we will notify you via email. I would now like to introduce the moderator of this webinar, IHF CEO, Eric Derudendek. Eric? Hello, yeah, welcome everyone. We are very happy to have you uh, with us. Uh, we have uh, 67 participants, so very large number from all around the world. And with no further ado, let me provide you with the objective of this session. We wanted to give the floor to healthcare executives that have to organize the response at the level of health services. So this uh, first uh, webinar from a series that will allow us to go around the world will allow us to hear directly from the CEO of one of the Paris region hospital system he will share his experience, the actions taken, key learning, and he will share how this has changed the vision in uh, how they operate, the importance of the resilience and the ability for the health workers, and how they worked with the community to manage the crisis. In within three weeks, they had to expand dramatically their capacities to create dedicated COVID units, increase intensive care while adapting emergency services, finding alternative solutions for their chronic care patients. So to make all this possible, they had also to mobilize additional worker, the community to get also additional equipment. So to get more into the details of all this story, which is, you know, unfortunately real life experience, let me introduce you our speaker, Cédric Lucier. So he is the CEO of a public hospital system, which have three different facilities in northern part of Paris region in France. Previously, Cédric, before having this position, was already the CEO of a, a general hospital in the Paris region. And before that, he was the chief of staff of the French Hospital Federation, that is a, a member of the International Hospital Federation. And uh, he even represented the French Hospital Federation to the International Hospital Board between 2011 and 2017. So as for myself, Cédric will give you this with the flavor of the French accent. And Cédric, uh, please, the floor is yours and we'll be very uh, happy to hear about your, your experience uh, from your hospital in the region, northern part of Paris. Go ahead, Cédric, the floor is yours. Thank you. Thank you very much, Eric, for your kind introduction and I'll give you both a flavor of French accent and also, of course, insights on what's going on in France among French healthcare institutions uh, since the beginning of the crisis. To give you some uh, a general overview of the situation in France, I just want to remind everyone uh, that France was has suffered from a big crisis. Right now, we have a, a, uh, around a, 16,000 VEF and uh, one third of them are uh, uh, used to live in uh, nursing homes, usually related to general hospitals. There is a national lockdown since March 16 and uh, it will last at least until May 11th 
uh, it should last longer in some uh, regions like the Paris metropolitan area, which suffered a lot of clusters. One of the massive uh, issues uh, is, of course, the shortage of protective masks and equipment and the shortage of intensive care units, which has been a continuous threat for our institutions since the beginning of the crisis. Only for a few days uh, are we on a stable situation, but for the four four first weeks of the crisis, we were really in a hurry, always having to send people to work in a dangerous conditions and always asking us if our ICU would be uh, uh, enough to, uh, to avoid some ethical uh, questions. So this shortage was a key issue and the source of mismanagement of hospitals in the crisis. Uh, it's, I mean, uh, I'm a bit ashamed to acknowledge that hundreds of nurses and thousands of patients have become infected with the virus only because they were not considered as at an early stage of the crisis as a priority. Uh, two days ago, uh, I was informed that one of my nurse uh, in a palliative care uh, unit died of the COVID. And uh, if we have a look at the situation, frankly, she should have deserved more equipment, more safety equipment than she had in the first days of the epidemic. Uh, we can notice that since the, the epidemic reached France, health officials have chosen to test only the most serious case of COVID-19 which generally means those for which hospitalization is required. Uh, sadly, uh, we were not in the same position as some countries where testing was uh, spread among the population so that we were able to uh, have a, a good information on the, on the contacts, uh, on the likely contacts. And second, unlike other countries, France does not carry out post-mortem tests, meaning if a person with symptoms resembling COVID dies without being tested, they are not included in the official mortality figure, which is, of course, uh, another source of uh, difficulties if you want to benchmark the importance and strength of the, of the virus. As I told you, Paris metropolitan area was an early cluster. Right now, we have uh, around 3,600 deaths and 130,000 confirmed cases only in Paris. Despite our efforts to triple the intensive care units in our region, which was uh, the objective that we had at the beginning of the uh, epidemic, we only had this uh, crisis uh, overcome thanks to a massive transfer of intensive care patients towards other regions. We had more than 80 patients in other regions of France and other European countries. And of course, I really want to take this opportunity, thanks to this webinar, to thank all the European countries which have helped us Germany, Austria, Luxembourg, and Switzerland for their solidarity. We are really very grateful because without this uh, solidarity of uh, our countries, frankly, we couldn't have made it uh, 10 days ago. I should also notice that there is still no tracking system to identify the number of patients tested, negative, positive, profession, ages, sexes, comorbidities, our government just announced that an, an app uh, uh, that you can download uh, uh, with your cell phone uh, would be available in two or three weeks from now. It will be on a voluntary basis, so not, nothing mandatory, of course, uh, which means that uh, some part of the population may be out of the, this tracking system uh, if, it's, uh, if it comes to be useful. Our idea 
of course, in France is to follow the best practices that we have identified with a notification system for the members of our community who have registered. So we may able to separate all the contacts and uh, perhaps in uh, hotels. That's the idea right now. Uh, due to the shortage of individual masks, that will be my last general idea on France, it is still very unusual to see people in the streets of Paris with individual protection, like uh, last surgery masks, for instance, though the situation is slowly improving as the shortage of surgery masks is uh, now behind us. So what about French hospitals in this crisis? Uh, as I told you, we had this shortage of equipment, which was really painful and uh, very difficult to, to recognize, uh, which is now uh, overcome thanks to uh, national mobilization, thanks to mobilization of the community. It's really clearly striking, but uh, I, I am a CEO of three acute care hospitals. In, in uh, each of these, uh, the, the area uh, that is uh, uh, part of the community in which the uh, Acute care hospital is uh, is uh, was created. Uh, there are a lot of workers, dressmakers, small businesses who have adapted their their um, ways of producing things so that they uh, gave us some mask and some personal uh, equipment that they designed themselves. So if you uh, are in a, right now in a French hospital. You can see from various colors or, or various uh, types of habits uh, the, the protections uh, for the for the staff. It is really striking because I mean every two or three days I have someone else who uh, is giving me some uh, some protections and say, well, it's for the good of the community. We are not used to PAPR, and uh, right now we are moving to low-cost solutions, trying following uh, Italy to use, uh, that may sound funny, but right now it's, uh, I'm a bit ashamed to, to say that, some snorkeling masks, which were adapted by industrials with this uh, special protection on the, on the tube, so that uh, the staff which is working in the COVID units or even in the intensive care units is uh, more protected than it is right now with the, the, the usual uh, material. All professionals who are in contact with potential COVID patients are using what is called in the US N95 mask. In, in, in Europe, we call them FFP2, but uh, it's almost the same. So this is the, the rule number one. And for the other uh, members of staffs, uh, they are using some surgery masks. Uh, we don't have any shortage anymore. Uh, I was talking about the community. Frankly, I was very surprised uh, by what was going on since the beginning of the crisis because Profession, uh, uh, health professionals uh, are treated now in the media and in the general population like heroes. Uh, there is a habit now at 8 p.m. Uh, that they should uh, get a round of applause on the terraces of the, of the, of the streets and of the cities. And uh, every day, two, uh, I mean twice or, or even three times a day, we are receiving some gifts from the community, some, uh, some drinks, some food, some, any kind of, of drinks. Just uh, uh, 10 minutes ago, just be, before the, the, the webinar starts, uh, I was offered by a farmer, which, who I, I don't uh, even know for, uh, one, ton, one ton of apples. Uh, and uh, with, this, with this message, you care for us, we think about you. And he gave us one ton of apples. It was 10 minutes ago. And this is a really very, I mean, this is a source of 
motivation for anyone in the hospitals, of course, uh, and of course also a, a reason for uh, heavy logistics because uh, uh, a lot of staffs are right now we are converted from uh, the financial and the, the, uh, the some of our divisions to only welcoming what is given by the community and finding a balance between i mean the these, these good things and uh, what can be done really in a hospital where we have a lot of of course of constraints uh, in uh, in the care for patients i must tell you also that i would never have imagined what has been possible in two or three weeks uh, in my hospital we have been able to create three dedicated emergency room units and eight COVID units and to triple the number of intensive care beds uh, through a mobilization of course of everyone we close surgery we close uh, outpatients we close a lot of things we hired some staff who were uh, retired who just want to volunteer and say hey we, we can help you and uh, in we have uh, a total reengineering of the the whole uh, uh, hospital organization. Uh, DS has created a very intense and positive atmosphere, uh, which has uh, at least lasted for four, three weeks, and which has put an end to the silo culture of big hospital to a more collaborative and comprehensive way of taking care of patients. For instance, I've seen some pediatrists uh, working in the night in uh, adult units. I've seen some surgeons uh, helping for infectious, uh, for, for COVID uh, medicine units, which I would never have imagined two months ago. Uh, so clearly, uh, among a lot of professionals, there is a hope uh, that uh, this crisis, of course, dramatic uh, with so many deaths and so many suffering, but might bring some uh, positive things in the general organization of the system and in the, the way that our professionals in any hospitals are working together much more than they used to. Uh, I have to tell you also that this uh, working to together process, uh, I didn't say that before, was possible also because we had the help of any healthcare institution. We have in France a rather public system, but with a very powerful uh, private for profit uh, sector. And uh, any healthcare institution whatever the, 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 the way it is financed uh, has worked with us to uh, welcome the patients. As I told you, we, we had it was mandatory by the state to close all the surgery programmed or, or emergency. And uh, this was possible because all of our patients were sent to a private for-profit uh, healthcare institution next to our, one of our hospitals. Uh, they did not ask any uh, any fees, any individual fees, uh, so that the money wouldn't be a problem for any patient. And thanks to that, we moved, of course, a lot of our staff from the surgery and from the operating room uh, to the intensive care unit. So clearly, uh, it was uh, for healthcare system uh, as a whole uh, uh, an opportunity to find back a new balance between what every everyone is does every day. Uh, as I told you, this was the general framework given by the uh, any regional health agency. But uh, as you know, sometimes the framework they, they doesn't they don't work because. Uh, people do not believe in uh, in that, or they don't find it uh, uh, useful or interesting to to follow. Uh, we had this heavy crisis, and for the first time, I mean, uh, no one would care about the money. Uh, right now, as I will tell you, 
things are changing, but for the first month of the crisis, it was a, a, a free money world where everyone was able to do what he, he might uh, do uh, as, as, uh, as far as uh, caring for patients, for COVID patients was concerned. I must tell you that as a CEO, uh, faced of a shortage of almost everything, staff, equipment, and all, I had to make some choice uh, and to set priorities with the medical community, which were, of course, questionable. As I told you when I was telling you about the death of a nurse a few days ago, I chose to send the safety equipment uh, and staff to ER COVID units and intensive care units. And uh, I, I chose not to, to send them to geriatrics and to psychiatric, which is, of course, uh, is seen as very unfair by these professionals. And uh, they were seen as second class uh, workers, uh, uh, treating second class patients. And this is one of the things that we have to fix right now uh, before, I hope we won't have to face a second wave, but uh, it's to uh, have a more comprehensive uh, uh, and uh, inclusive uh, way of seeing patients, uh, chronic care patients, uh, and to check that no one was left, uh, was left on, on the road, which was the case. And uh, my priorities were criticized by uh, some of my staff and I, I can understand that. I, I don't feel very at ease with some of the decisions. Uh, if, if we talk about psychiatry, it's very interesting because uh, of course uh, we have to close some of our outpatient facilities, uh, which is a, a, bit, a big issue because some of these uh, patients I find it very hard to respect the strict uh, social confinement of our national lockdown. So uh, one of the first thing that we have to do next month uh, is to send again our professionals in these uh, units. Uh, if we want to prevent uh, their mental health in the, in the long term and to avoid the crisis in our emergency room units, which will be uh, under pressure from the COVID. Uh, I will conclude with four challenges that right now we have to tackle. Uh, the first is how to preserve the unity of health professional. Uh, there was, a, I mean, a, something like a fairy tale is in what I've been uh, uh, telling you about the unity of professionals uh, inside and outside the hospitals. Right now, this consensus on the crisis is weakened because uh, any healthcare institution has to uh, uh, said uh, has to define a strategy to reopen uh, their specialized uh, units in medicine and surgery, of course, and this creates like a competitive spirit because uh, everyone is thinking about uh, what will be the the, the consequence on the on this COVID crisis on uh, the market share of any hospitals and. Uh, what is the economic model and fi financial framework that we are going to find out to, uh, to, to finance hospitals in 2020 and after. So really, uh, it's difficult to, uh, to maintain this consensus and it could be very dangerous if uh, everyone plays uh, alone. Uh, and if we have, as we could fear it, uh, sadly, uh, a second wave of uh, COVID uh, patients. I will, I've been talking to you about the, uh, the financial framework. In France, we have a DRG diagnosis related group system. It was suspended for a few months, but right now uh, it's very difficult to take into account all this changing in the uh, in, uh, or in the supply of uh, healthcare and uh, all the extra uh, expenses that we have done in the in the in the last month, for instance, uh, I have hired more than sixty nurses and fifteen uh, 
uh, no, almost uh, no, 18 uh, physicians uh, just to, to because uh, COVID was so difficult to, uh, to, to care for. And uh, of course, we don't know exactly because it's difficult to bargain with the Ministry of Health in this uh, crisis, uh, what will, uh, how we can finance all these uh, 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 actions. And it's very important because we, uh, if we talk about the money, it's because we are talking about the patients. Uh, we have uh, uh, a growing number of non-COVID pathologies, patients who refuse to uh, go to the hospital at the, at the peak of the crisis, uh, in cardiology, in pneumology, in diabetes, and they are coming back more and more uh, through the emergency rooms uh, units, and we have to balance uh, what will be left to the COVID units and what should re reopen. And usually it's done uh, both on the, it's, it's, uh, it has an economic signification. Uh, where should we put staff and money? So right now we are in the, uh, we are in the, in a situation where no one exactly can uh, understand how we will move. We will never move back to the situation before, of course, but we will move to a, I mean, uh, to a halfway between where we are and where we were two months ago. First, the third challenge is to prevent the boomerang effect for chronic disease. Uh, we have a lot of constant consultation, uh, not only for psychiatry, but for uh, uh, a lot of uh, specialties. Uh, and the first feedback of the emergency room uh, specialist is that more and more patients are coming on a heavy basis because uh, for weeks, they, they were not in connection with any health professional because they were afraid uh, of, uh, of catching the COVID uh, if they go to a, a nurse or to a physician. So uh, if you have a look at the diabetes, for instance, uh, clearly uh, the type of patients that uh, we, are now, we have now is uh, only some isolated patients with a very poor relations with other people. So we have to uh, be able to uh, find back relations for these patients so that they do not come in the hospital because frankly, we do not have any place. Despite all the extra staff, uh, I don't have any single nurse right now to open another unit. So uh, I have to move units from the COVID to the non-COVID. And we have, this is my last uh, challenge, to have a midterm vision of the crisis. Uh, because the early first lesson that we can make is, of course, uh, the lack of this uh, midterm and long term vision, uh, the lack of equipment, the lack of uh, uh, units, uh, the lack of uh, public health vision, the lack of a connective uh, integrated uh, care. Uh, well, it, it has caused a lot of death, it has caused an economic crisis, and it's a source of uh, uncertainty for, for, for long. So this is the first lesson. And the second lesson, of course, is how to work together better than we used to. Uh, we have to maintain the spirits of working together with any healthcare institution in France. And we still don't know how, but we do know that if COVID uh, uh, turns on to be a, a seasonal uh, epidemic, as it may be, or if we, may, if we have some time before finding any cure or vaccine, well, uh, that means that our, our healthcare system, they, they cannot uh, overcome this uh, another crisis, a second or a third wave. So uh, it would be very risky to, uh, come back to the situation of January, in my opinion. And of course, we have to uh, be uh, used to uh, 
this uh, coming back of endemic infection diseases for, for a few years, in my opinion. So thank you for listening to me. I was pleased and honored to share with you some easy and first lessons on an insight on what's going on in France. And I'll be very pleased and honored to listen to your remarks and answer your questions. Uh, because I think that this is really the case for uh, 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 sharing knowledge and benchmark on uh, this uh, world and uh, this global crisis. Thank you. Yeah, thank you so much, Cédric. I mean, this is uh, outlining uh, very well, the, you know, the situation in your country and what has been done. We have a number of questions. Some are very specific and some are more broader. But before going into these questions, I will ask, uh, take the advantage of having the floor. And I, I really want to ask you, you know, as a CEO of a large public hospital system, what has been for you the very specific challenge that you didn't have to face before and that you did face before because of the, the COVID response? What is, you know, the very specific challenge that you had as a CEO to face in your leadership as a leader of this organization. You mentioned the fact that you had ethical issues uh, that you had to handle. So this is one. Are there any other ones? And how much did you have the autonomy to make decisions rather than just to put in action what the health authorities have recommended? Thank you, Eric. Uh, I mean, this month uh, was crazy because uh, we are used to uh, take some time to, uh, for any of our decisions because uh, we have a, a kind of governance which uh, enables us to uh, work together before taking a decision. What was a, a key challenge uh, was to uh, forget all, all, all our habits and take decision in the hour. Uh, I mean, uh, if you think about the shortage of masks and equipment, uh, I mean, there, there, was, there was something in the, in the most intense part of the crisis, there was something like a decision an hour. And uh, what was surprising is that, is that uh, people had this sense of emergency and they didn't criticize. Now they are, of course, in a, in a new position, but they never criticized. They never, uh, they never, uh, I mean, uh, do their, their standalone posi uh, usual uh, position. And it was something like a wide open environment where you, you could do almost everything, uh, say, uh, triple and why not uh, uh, double uh, this intensive care, uh, close this and open that tomorrow, the day after tomorrow. So it was something like, um, I mean, in a, like, I, like I was a, a fireman uh, only uh, with a fire inside and, and the, 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 the entire world has disappeared. Uh, this was a challenge because of course we had to uh, we, we made a lot of, of mistakes, of course. Uh, I've done some, uh, I, I did some mistakes because uh, I think that it, you couldn't avoid to, to uh, it was so, so there was such a pressure on you uh, because uh, if you think about intensive care, for three weeks, there was no place left and young patients uh, queuing uh, in the emergency rooms and uh, physicians say, uh, open something, do something, find something. Uh, he's young, he, he deserves to, to live. And uh, you, you just uh, uh, hang out and say, what should I do? Well, to be honest, uh, I was out of the system for five days because I was hospitalized um, uh, from the COVID myself. But when I came back, it was, a, uh, I mean, this kind of, pressure and easiness also to understand the pressure because uh, everybody understood that 
someone has to 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 make decisions, good or good or no, but uh, good or bad. But there were decisions to 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 make every every hour. Okay, and this uh, links to a question we have among the things that you've tried. Is, is it some that really did not work so that, you know, if you can advise so that people don't try them because you try them and you realize that doesn't work? Uh, I won't say, uh, well, it's difficult because uh, uh, if I had the information right now on the rhythm of uh, the the supply of masks and equipment, I would have set different priorities so my entire staff would have been protected at the highest level. And uh, as uh, I didn't have the information and then I have to have a, a margin uh, for, for the heaviest units, I made as if some units would be completely COVID free. And this is my early lesson. The COVID free is, a, is, an, ob, is, an, is an objective, but it's not a reality. Uh, in my palliative care unit, uh, there was an infection uh, and 90% uh, of my patients died in three days. In other units which were supposed to be COVID free, uh, uh, two of them were completely uh, damaged and ravaged by uh, the COVID. So we uh, moved, uh, and we didn't understand at the beginning. We moved. We had we had uh, in uh, we have some uh, old facilities in my network of hospitals. We are, we are building a, a new one, which would have put uh, things easier. But we had a lot of double rooms. And uh, I didn't understand at the beginning that one of the key questions was to move to individual rooms, whatever the price, but it would stop the spread of the, the COVID in my own uh, institution. And uh, I think that if I had the, the, the ability to uh, go in a time machine uh, five weeks from now, uh, I would have moved uh, uh, rapidly to uh, this single room uh, approach uh, because the once again the split between COVID units and COVID free units is very difficult to to achieve. Yeah and along with this question you know did you uh, I didn't did you have workers that were COVID positive tested uh, identified and those when they were posted uh, identified did they still work if they were asymptomatic or uh, the fact that they have been tested positive put them outside of work and if they did work you know uh, under with which protection or precautions uh, in, we had some uh, changes of approach at the national level in the crisis and uh, in our hospitals, we have been, we have followed uh, all the, the analysis that were given every day by the Ministry of Health. Uh, the, in most of the period, the rule was that uh, when you were, when you, when you had no symptoms and you, you were tested positive, you had to uh, be out of the hospitals for one week and you could come back only with a uh, surgical mask uh, unless you are working in a COVID unit, of course. Uh, so there was no, uh, no special uh, protection. Uh, the difficulty was rather with uh, people who had symptoms, uh, physicians, nurses, and uh, the first uh, regulation was that they were supposed to be out uh, for three weeks and then for two weeks. And sometimes they, it was very difficult to respect the rules because uh, we had so, so many needs. And uh, right now, 
we still don't know much about the virus. And uh, it is possible that, uh, it, is, it is likely even, that some of the uh, infections were brought through, uh, through uh, professionals who came after two weeks only with a surgical mask, which of course was not enough if you move from a, from a room to another uh, and uh, an infection is going on. So uh, I think we, we didn't, uh, we should have uh, uh, been uh, uh, finding some more delays, but the national level didn't agree with that. So I just followed the national rules. Yeah, so, so that means that, yeah, you, you have been really in between two, uh, like uh, a pressure between following national rules that were changing and not obvious and trying to find the local uh, response. Uh, exactly. Were you, because you still had other patients than the COVID patients and you still had, you know, a process. So how did you manage with the regular, you know, safety processes, uh, clinical governance, uh, um, uh, doing, uh, dealing with uh, incidents, you know, incident reporting and things like that. Did you drop all that to be able to really focus on emergency response and emergency care to the COVID patients? Or yeah. did you, were you still able to continue to uh, have in place uh, all the processes to uh, uh, maintain, you know, the safety and the quality of care that are usually in place in a hospital? No, no. Uh, we clearly we moved to a, a, a warm medicine uh, system. Uh, first, most of our non-COVID patients were dropped out of the hospitals in three days. Uh, we we stopped surgery. We stopped uh, any. Uh, uh, we, we we had two maternity, so we had to to uh, uh, maintain these maternities, of course, but. 90% of my patients, uh, except for maternity, uh, were COVID three weeks ago. Only in oncology, we had this, uh, uh, we, we couldn't close the, the unit, but all the other units uh, were COVID with no clinical governance, only uh, uh, some, uh, um, I mean, uh, some visits, some uh, daily visits of our uh, hygiene units uh, because uh, there were so many questions uh, asked by the professionals uh, and uh, though we had some uh, social media to share with them uh, the questions, we really thought that uh, it was uh, useful to send our, our, our specialized staff uh, and uh, um, tell them about confinement and what could be done to protect themselves and to protect the patients. But clearly, the the, the hospitals, uh, as I knew them, have disappeared in a, it, it, clear in three or four days. Uh, there was nothing like w what was uh, done before in January. It was another hospital with uh, uh, some staff. Uh, in uh, over units that they are, have uh, usual habits. And what was very striking is uh, that most of the patients had disappeared. Uh, we still don't know exactly uh, what's going on, but uh, of course, people are so afraid to go to the hospital that uh, they, are, uh, they are staying at home even if it's dangerous for them. And uh, other thing is that, of course, in traumatology or things like that, if people stay home, they, they won't hurt themselves. So uh, this, there was this, uh, this war medicine, which was completely different from our usual uh, uh, governance and uh, the type of medicine that we are doing every day. And part of that, you know, we know that in France, uh, it's a country where people are very uni unionized, that they easily go on strike. There is, you know, quite easily uh, dispute. Uh, 
uh, you said that there was a strong unity. It means that the, you mentioned the, the health workers, but on the, the unions also were fully behind. You had really a full consensus. How they, or did you have some people, individuals, or through organization, formal organization, who challenged uh, the decisions or didn't really comply with them, uh, uh, you know, uh, nicely? The, uh, I'm, I will go on with the fairy tale. Uh, my trade unions, which of course are difficult to handle, uh, they were very supportive and they uh, have done everything to help me to uh, care for the patients. Uh, they have accepted things that I never thought they, they would accept. Uh, some of their representatives, they have offered to work though they didn't have to you know they have they have some uh, some credits which uh, usually uh, help them not to be uh, in the close to the patients and they all said no no we want to help we want to to be useful so for one month uh, sorry for the fairy tale habit but uh, it was it was crazy they were all together uh, even now, after five weeks, uh, they didn't ask me uh, any of the usual meetings where uh, they are uh, advocating the safety of, uh, of workers uh, for, I mean, a, a lot of questions. So no, they, they, they were fully supportive and I'm very grateful. And I would never have thought to see, uh, to see that in my life as a CEO. Okay, that's uh, showing that when there is a big crisis, uh, it's so important that we get together and fight it together. You mentioned a lot the issue of the shortage of equipment and these questions about, you know, whether you contemplate at some point the reuse of the protective equipment, for example, the N95 to re-sterilize them and reuse them. Was it this a question or uh, uh, it never happened because uh, the, the, these equipments cannot be reused uh, whatever way? That's a very good question. As I told you, I followed the national rules which prevent us of reusing uh, this equipment, the 95. Uh, and the consequence of this was that we uh, left patients in the streets, uh, our patients uh, with no protection, uh, infecting uh, their family. And second consequence, of course, is that so many um, professionals in psychiatry and geriatrics they did, they did not get some protection uh, in the two first uh, weeks of the crisis. So uh, I'm not sure that we made the, this, uh, we, we made a good choice, but it was done at the national level, as, as I told you. Right now, uh, we have uh, been uh, offered by, uh, as I told you, some small businesses, some, uh, some equipment that uh, we will wash uh, every day. So uh, from our own initiative, uh, we have some, uh, uh, some things that uh, were designed to be washed every day because uh, in my hospital, uh, there are thousands of masks, for instance, every day uh, that uh, we need. So uh, it's difficult to, to see so many things uh, uh, going, uh, going uh, away. Uh, and which could have been reused in some circumstances rather than nothing. Uh, but uh, uh, in the, the, the first week of the crisis, it was difficult from, uh, for single hospitals to move out of the way that was uh, publicly uh, advocated by the government. Okay, yeah, sure. That's, that's obvious that, uh, you know, that's always a difficulty, especially in a public organization. But even without any, uh, if it was not public, the litigation risk is so high when you go outside of the recommendation of the health authorities. You, you mentioned that you created, uh, I think, six uh, COVID units. Uh, you eight. insisted eight, 
you insisted on the fact that you, that uh, you know single bedroom is is probably the best option but yeah. there is also a question to how you have uh, you know in this unit have you created different category of unit and how did you move between intensive care and these units for example because of the shortage did you only keep the people in intensive care on the life threatening episode and move them back to a post intensive unit did you create a kind of a middle range unit between the normal and intensive care for covid patients that had the respiratory problems that would just need oxygen uh, so how did you organize your response in between the various units and the move the flow of patients we see we tripled both the intensive care unit and the post intensive care units can you give uh, figures the numbers uh, yeah uh, uh, from, More or less, uh, I mean. from uh, 14 uh, intensive care beds to uh, 36 and from uh, 12 uh, post intensive care to uh, 24. Uh, I hope I, I didn't make any mistake. Uh, that's the first thing. Second thing is that uh, the COVID units, they have much more, uh, twice more uh, staff as a, gen as a usual unit. So they were designed to, uh, not only because uh, there's a much work, but also safety procedures uh, and heavy patients who are coming back uh, from, uh, I mean, uh, uh, heavy, heavy situation. So this was the second answer. Uh, what is, what lacks right now is uh, the rehabilitation process because uh, a lot of the patients who are starting to go out of the in intensive care uh, they really need a, a rehabilitation process and uh, we need some specialized units. We didn't, well, I mean, uh, we need to triple the rehabilitation if we were logical. And so uh, this is our, our one of the issues right now for my institution is to uh, know if we are moving towards uh, more rehabilitation units inside our network or find partnerships so that we may be able uh, in case of a second wave to uh, to be able to respond to the to the needs of the intensive care units but uh, rehabilitation is very important in the healthcare french healthcare system it has never been uh, set as a priority and thus uh, we can see, uh, we can still see patients who are staying in intensive care units or rather in post intensive care units uh, because it's the only way to treat them correctly. Okay, thank you, Cedric. Just one last short question, and after I'll do the wrap up and we'll put an end to this. Uh, um, uh, webinar. Uh, thank you uh, so much. So the last question is is one that is also uh, very controversial. Is about the environmental disinfection. Um, did you change the processes within the hospital about the environmental disinfection? Did you extend it outside the compound of the hospital, rather than you used to do it? What did you do? Uh, a lot of things, uh, but it's, uh, a lot of small details because uh, we had to uh, hire some staff uh, to, of course, to uh, wash the units, uh, the, all the surfaces uh, that are dangerous uh, uh, twice more or even more in the year and, uh, than, uh, than before. We had to uh, set uh, mandatory rules, uh, very, which is very crucial, for professionals so that we are uh, sure that no one uh, is uh, yeah so about environmental we uh, set this as a priority and we bought other things and people were hired to wash and to control all the staff 
uh, to be sure that, uh, that they wash their hands uh, each time they change the room. Okay, thank you very much, Cedric. As you can guess, there are many other questions. Uh, so it means that uh, your uh, um, presentation will trigger a lot of uh, uh, further questions and this is an important matter. If I may, I will just summarize uh, and uh, a few points that you just put forward, which are, I think, very important lessons. Uh, first, um, in situation like that, it's clear that you really need to have a captain on board and that the captain on board, you know, really needs to make very quick decisions. These decisions, sometimes they may be with mistakes, but uh, it's better to have a mistake than to make no decisions. So this is a, one important element. And it's, this captain is not challenged because everybody is uh, very uh, keen to have somebody who is leading and taking the directions because in such a stressful period, it's very important to, to feel at least this uh, safety having somebody in charge of, of uh, leading the organization. The other thing which I thought was very interesting is the way you have rebalanced the activities within the public and private sector, which uh, in France is a very competitive uh, uh, tension between the public and private sector, and that uh, more or less the public sector has really focused on the uh, public role with emergency and facing the COVID and the emergency while the private sector was given much more responsibilities to take over the ongoing, I would say, health situation and problem to the population, because uh, not taking the care of that, it has a major consequences over time. And that's lead to the third uh, uh, remark, is that uh, because of the threat of uh, the fear that the COVID has inspired to the people, number of patients, who didn't show up to the hospitals why they should have or they would have in normal situation, will have to be treated. So we'll have to find ways to mitigate the consequences of postponing treatment. And uh, perhaps this is also an opportunity for redistributing some roles between hospitals and primary care, especially for the chronic uh, conditions. And, um, and this is, I think, the, the key elements uh, that uh, I wanted to underscore. The last one is the one around uh, preparing the post-COVID. And what you mentioned is also very important, uh, is that uh, it is very uh, critical that when we move to the post-COVID, uh, where we'll have to reopen activities to deal with uh, the normal situation, if I can say, that means taking care of the various pathologies, we have to avoid that individual strategies uh, uh, related to specialities and the people with uh, the specialties are disrupting the post-COVID reopening that has to be smooth and that has to take really strongly in consideration also the rehabilitation as a big priority. Thank you. I hope I didn't, um, uh, I made justice to, to, to your presentation. And um, uh, I'll give the floor to, for the closing information uh, to uh, uh, Patricia. Thank you, Eric. Thank you very much, Cedric, for joining us today. It was a very, um, uh, a very insightful discussion and uh, thank you so much for your time. We would also like to thank everyone who joined us today. Again, we will be posting the video recording of this webinar on our website and you will be notified by email once it's available. Um, we hope you can join us again. We have several, several webinars signed up in the next few weeks. Um, the schedule is on your screen and you can register on our website. Just go to www.ihf-fih.org slash webinars. The next one is tomorrow at 9 o'clock UTC. Dr. Wang Junli will share how South Korea has been successfully dealing with COVID-19 and how the Myeongji Hospital has responded and kept their staff safe by adapting initiatives since the beginning of the outbreak. So again, um, thank you everyone. Please keep safe and healthy. Uh, together we will overcome this global crisis. Thanks again for joining us today. Thank you very much, Cedric. Thanks, Patricia. Thank, Thank you very everyone. much and uh, keep well, keep safe.